Uh, Iridu Marang, you and do Yanada Heist, Baladu Radri Gilang. A Rambaji Bull, Brangley Bull, Mir Gandhi, Bala Williams, Sindamaradu, Yagaragu, Turbul Gu, Yugumbe Gu, Mianjin Gu. Hello, everybody. My name is Anita Heist, and I have Wiradjuri belonging from Arambi and Brungal Missions in central New South Wales. I'm a Williams, and I'm speaking to you today from uh, Mianjin. Most of you all know that is the city of Brisbane, and I pay my respects to the traditional owners past and present, um, Yugumbe, Turubul, uh, Yagara peoples, the original storytellers of this place. Um, I wanna welcome you all to the Black Words panel today with Grace Lucas Pennington, Dr. Jared Thomas and uh, Ellen Van Nieven. If you attended the Barry Andrews address last night, you'll know that we had a discussion around the need to amplify and elevate Aboriginal voices across sectors and particularly in the space that we all work in, in academia, in the arts, in media and in classrooms and lecture theatres. And that's what today's panel is all about elevating three specific um, or three particular voices today. It's an opportunity for you to hear from talented, skilled and qualified creative individuals who also happen to be First Nations Australians. Now I'm going to introduce every panellist individually just before they speak, but I wanted just to give a really quick intro based on, um, I reached out to the 2019 Miles Franklin Award winner. Most of you will know Melissa Lukashenko. And I asked her to give me three words to describe each one of our panelists. And I'm terribly sorry about the lawnmower in the background. So this is what she said about Ellen. Brilliant, strong, respectful. Jared, creative, brave, grounded, and Grace, thoughtful, passionate, and deadly. She then, she then added, and I do quote, Grace needs to visit her mother more often. I'll leave that there with you, Grace. For those of you who don't know, Melissa Lukashenko is Grace Lucas Pennington's mother. So there's some good genes there. Now, our plan today is that panel members will speak for around eight minutes each and then we'll open up for questions. Uh, as Joe mentioned, you can be putting those questions through the chat box as we go or you can wait till the end and remain completely focused. Um, but the idea is that this is as much engagement as, as we can have and that you get to ask all the questions of these creatives um, that you'd like to. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce Ellen Van Nieven. Ellen is an award-winning writer of Mananjali, Yugambe and Dutch heritage. Her first book, Heat and Light, was the recipient of the David Nippon Award, the Dobby Literary Award and the New South Wales Premier's Literary Award for Indigenous Writers. Her second book, a collection of poetry, Comfort Food, was shortlisted in the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards, Kenneth Slessor Prize. And her most recent collection, which we've just launched um, May 13, is Throat, and that has already been awarded the inaugural Quentin Bryce Award for a book on the University of Queensland Press's list each year that celebrates women's lives and or promotes gender equality. Uh, Ellen worked at Black and Right for six years, editing and mentoring Indigenous writers and editors, but she's also an editor now. Uh, she's done three anthologies and most recently worked on Homeland Calling, words from a new generation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices. I'm looking for Ellen on my screen. There you are. Ellen, I read, I was, I was really interesting to read that uh, in your 20s, you began taking writing seriously, but actually you were six years old when you first started um, being interested in writing, thanks to the encouragement of your grade one teacher. Can you tell us a little bit about your love of writing and how that led from you know grade one to actually winning the David Honor Award in 2013, and how that award impacted on your writing and publishing journey. Sorry, thanks, Tida. Uh, can everyone hear me now? Yeah, I, and and thank you. And I would love to hear after I speak about how old you were when you first loved writing. Um, I think that would be cool to know. But yeah, for me, it started um, really young. Um, 
I, you know, my I do need to mention my um, grade one teacher, Mrs. Grenville, and I also need to mention my mum as being two women that instilled in me a love of reading very early on. Um, so I do want to acknowledge that I'm on Turrbal country north of Mianjin. Um, Yugumbe from the Malanjali family. Um, my grandmother was a Williams and my grandfather was a Curry, so two big uh, Aboriginal families in Brisbane, Mianjin. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge Turbo and Yagara and Yugumbe. Um, so having a very strong, deadly, big black family, also being mixed race. My dad's a white migrant from the Netherlands, um, which is a country that has a really awful colonial past and ongoing. Um, having sort of two, two big families growing up in here uh, in southeast Queensland and going to the school that's just really close to where I am now. Um, I'm back in my childhood home. Um, coming full circle a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was uh, reading very young, but I also had a lot of um, difficulties, developmental difficulties when I was younger. So actually the reason why my grade one teacher, Miss Grenville, spent extra time on me is because I was having some, some issues, some troubles, particularly when I was younger in particularly writing. I couldn't you know, it took me till I was a lot longer than the other kids to be able to actually use a pen and pencil. Um, so I was six years old in grade two, but my grade one teacher was giving me extra classes um, in la at lunch break. So that's something that I think people would be surprised to know that um, I had a lot of issues in primary school and I've never really been very academic. Um, but here I am having published and a few books and edited a few books and part of this uh, deadly group and deadly, deadly family of writers. Um, so I really, this, I was a very imaginative kid. I really just saw stories all the time, just everywhere. Um, and Mrs. Grenville in grade six, she showed me Sally Morgan's My Place. Um, she chose, showed, showed me the, the children's version of that book, like I think the early readers version of that book, uh, which of course was published in 1988. Uh, and Mrs. Grenfell gave me my first ever writing exercise that I'd ever had. And she said, I want you to write about your place. Um, and so I did a little story. I said, you know, this is where I live and this is my family. and did a little children's book out of that. Um, and I said to my mum, I came home and said to my mum, I want to be a children's book author when I grow up. Um, so six years old. So it was really um, a fundamental thing. And I never had a teacher as good as Miss Grenville. <laughs> like she set the, the bar um, in grade one. And actually, um, I really had uh, struggled in my, particularly in my high school years with um, racism uh, with racist teachers and students um, that would bully me um, because of who I was. Um, so I, but I think that skill of being able to write and be in create different worlds never left me and it was actually a bit of a survival tactic that I used when I was an adolescent. Um, that leads me to uh, being um, going to university, going to QUT, studying creative writing, um, being part of a deadly um, student body at the Ujuru unit, named after Auntie Ujuru Nunapal, um, the beautiful act activist writer who you so beautifully talked about last night, um, Dr. Anita. Um, is credited as the first female uh, Aboriginal 
writer, uh, published writer. Um, but of course, when we say first, we are also including all of the people that have come before, um, all of our ancestors that have led us to where we are now. Um, and so being born in 1990, I'm in so, I have so much gratitude for those who paved the way to be uh, where I am now, where I could consider literature as an option when I was at university. Someone, like I said, born in 1990, at the age of 20, started the manuscript that would become Heat and Light. And I, through at uni, I developed um, an understanding of a few writers. It would get start to get bigger and bigger. But as soon as I heard of Ujiru Nunako, I then heard of um, Lisa Blair. Uh, I heard of um, Uncle Sam and his uh, son's work, um, the Sams. Um, I heard of uh, uh, Uncle Lionel Fogarty, who's related to me. Um, cousin, my, Sam's also my cousin. Um, I was then able to see, the, and these are Southeast Queensland names that I mentioned, I was able to see how uh, the environment that I was in was actually full with story and I didn't have to look too far, but I had been, um, my mind had been imprisoned by a very um, colonial literature that I had read at school. Uh, and university, um, but I was starting to break through those walls and becoming politicised at university through um, meeting some wonderful aunties and uncles and my fellow students who were very brave. There wasn't many of us studying creative industries at that time. It was more a concentration of, of health students. Um, and it was which was really interesting to see and I was at the time the only creative writing black creative writing student at the time I first heard of the David G knife on award probably in my last year of uni I was 20 20 years old 20 21 I, I became aware of an award that had close to a 25 year history um, that had published a book every year of the competition uh, of course um, coming out of UQP of the work of uh, so many different people too many people to name um, but for me personally it was um, a platform that I could you know I could see myself entering this award I could see the you know, the previous winners, this body of work, this um, canon, if you like, of Black Australian writing at UQP. It's not just UQP that we're publishing works. You know, we have to acknowledge Mother Bala as also um, sort of starting in the, those late 80s as well as the Unicorn starting in, in the late 80s um, near the time of the Bicentennial and also uh, other writers that black writers that were published by other publishing houses, but there was something going on in the waters in Queensland and with this award, even though it's a national award, I'm gonna, <laughs> and it's named after um, the deadly David E. Nikon, who of course is, is a South Australian man, but um, something about being in Queensland as well. Um, I, I, as a young person, could see this as, something that I could enter, which I just think is such a remarkable thing. And like I said, it really does come to a generational thing as well, that I was lucky that I was born in the year that I was born in because I didn't have to do the struggle and the fight to get published. Um, you know, the aunties and uncles had opened up the, the door for me and all I had to do was had that self-belief to enter my manuscript. I entered in in 2012 and I was shortlisted but didn't win and then I entered in 2013 and I won um, with my manuscript Heat and Light uh, which is a, 
a hybrid fiction manuscript. You could call it a collection of short stories or you could call it a novel that um, tells uh, generational stories of a Murray family based in Southeast Queensland. Uh, there's a lot of young queer characters in it. Um, it's kind of really written with that young voice of someone who's just kind of stepping out into their identity and has all of those influences of my life in it. Um, but it's also a real um, creative exercise where I was stretching the limits of my reality and my experience to imagine a better world for us as mob as well. So uh, have, have I done my eight minutes? <laughs> Uh, you have, and we're not focusing on Murray time, so I'm going to, but I've got, I've got more questions from that conversation, particularly yep. about moving from genres, the cross genres with, you know, short stories, poetry, and I wanted to ask about playwriting, but we'll bring that up at question time, if you don't mind, but thank you. I learned more, I've known you for years and I learned more about you just then, so thank you very much for that. Ellen. We're going to move um, straight along now to our next speaker, Dr. Jared Thomas. Jared is a Nukunu person of the Southern Flinders Ranges and the curator of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art and cultural material at the South Australian Museum. His titles for children include the Game Day series, co-authored with basketballer Paddy Mills, the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and Dallas Davis, the scientist and the city kids. His young adult novels include Sweet Guy, which I think is one of the most beautiful coming of age novels for a, a young fella that I've ever read, uh, Calypso Summer and Songs That Sound Like Blood. Jared's writing explores the power of belonging and culture. He's also a fabulous ambassador for the Indigenous Literacy Foundation and has run workshops at Millicapity School um, and Tiwi College um, up north as well. And in 2019, he was awarded a Churchill Fellowship to, quote, investigate colonised people's interpretive strategies in permanent gallery displays. Uh, that's in museums abroad, which I'm kind of guessing may be put on hold because of COVID. I'm not sure. But um, thanks for being here today, Jared. And I was wondering, and I've followed your career for many, many years now. Um, both of us are slightly older than Ellen. Uh, since your first play, which was Flash Red Ford, toured Uganda and Kenya in 1999, uh, until the trilogy that you've just done with Patty Mills, which I think was launched last year up here in Brisbane. You've written children's novels, YA novels and poetry. So I'm wondering if you can just give us a snapshot of the Jared Thomas writing story and what drives you and where you find your inspiration also across genres. Yeah, so thank you for the introduction, Anita, and thanks, Ellen. Um, yeah, um, basically my, my motivation has remained the same. So. Um, I start since before I wrote Flash Red Ford, my motivation was to address racism um, through writing. And I guess these days another motivator is the development of craft and I want to write, I want to be the best storyteller uh, that I possibly can. Um, and also probably representing, representing more diversity within the Aboriginal um, fiction. So diversity of Aboriginal characters and addressing stereotypes. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, as a young person, I think I had a very acute understanding of racism by the time that I was a teenager. Um, I was particularly interested in the plight of South Africans, South Africa's apartheid and Nelson Mandela. Uh, so I grew up in Port Augusta, which is 20% Aboriginal population. Um, both dad and mum are mixed heritage. Mum's Aboriginal families from Winton, Queensland. Um, dad's is Nukuna and Nadri. Um, so I was, yeah, growing up in Port Augusta, there was very little, there was one commercial television sta station in the ABC and I was, I was interested in current affairs and particularly Nelson Mandela. And um, I felt that apartheid was happening in my hometown. There was just such a stark division between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. Um, so I understood things like explicit, implicit, um, internalised racism, lateral violence, institutional racism through knowledge of my family's uh, 
members' experience of being placed in missions. And I was incredibly angry about this stuff and confused and frustrated and, you know, constantly um, at war with the world um, as, a, as a teenager. And, you know, trying to take that aggression out through sport and sometimes getting regularly getting into fist fights and stuff because that's the way we sorted it out as young kids in, in Port Augusta. Um, but then I saw a play by Roger Bennett, uh, who's an r and playwright called Funerals and Circuses in 1992 as part of the Adelaide uh, Festival. And it was the first time that I saw Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people working together to address racism. And it, it kind of mirrored things that I, that I knew very well. I mean, as a 15-year-old in Port Augusta, the mayor of the, t the town imposed a curfew uh, on youth, which was really directed to Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal youth um, and also kind of like uh, anti-drinking policy, again, that was targeted at Aboriginal people. So I saw that play. Um, it featured um, Paul Kelly, singer-songwriter, uh, Karen Fairfax, his former wife, directed it. Uh, had a local Aboriginal people in the cast. Um, lots of people that I know today, they say that play was incredibly influential on them, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. Um, so that, that was really what kicked it off for me. I thought, here's something I, I can do um, to address racism, and this is my mechanism for fighting. Um, and I went to, then I went to Adelaide University. So I was actually, when I was at school, and I guess another impetus was that I was playing, uh, we, we had this Aboriginal band at school. So when I was, from when I was about 13, um, I was playing in this band that played songs by No Fixed Address, Coloured Stone, Bob Marley, Midnight Oil. And that really kind of politicised me and provided an opportunity to talk with my grandfathers. Um, both of my grandfathers died um, when I was in my teens, but I had that time to really talk with them about their experiences. And um, so all of those things, yeah, that, that was my motivation for writing and, it's, and it remains to be my motivation. Um, you know, like I'm, I, I just finished the, the draft of a novel uh, on Sunday night and I started writing that that novel like three years ago now and it, it could have been purpose written for this moment it wasn't but it makes complete sense within a, a Black Life Matters context um, because these are things that you know we've, we've been working towards for years I mean Anita Kerry Reed Gilbert Kathy Craigie have been like my literary fairy godmothers um, for all of my adult life, supporting me and pushing me along. And, you know, from the, from the time that I met them, we, we were talking about um, black deaths in custody, uh, you know, limited access of Aboriginal people to edu education, services, poverty, um, et cetera. So these are the types of things that I try to speak about through my work, although um, primarily I write children's and young adult fiction. So if I just run through a couple of my works, Flash Red Ford um, was about institutionalised racism during the protection era. So it's a play that focused on my great grandfather's um, experiences. Love, Land and Money, um, another play. Um, I wanted to provide insight into so so the sophistication of Aboriginal culture. So um, song lines and also the complexity of Aboriginal life. So how do we as contemporary people integrate our traditions, our cultural heritage, um, ceremony, ritual, etc. cetera. Uh, Calypso Summer, which um, uh, just about to, to, to sign um, the extension of the option of a television adaptation of, the, of that novel. Um, here it is. And Ellen actually edited this, this novel. Um, so uh, that, that's about the impact of racism on the youth psyche, um, including 
how racism can con contribute to drug and alcohol use and, and destructive behaviours. And I guess how family and culture um, can help us through that kind of dislocation, that disconnect. Um, songs, like, songs That Sound Like Blood, uh, which was released, I think, in 2015. Um, and this also talks about racism and how it limits access to, can limit access to education. Um, the Patty Mill series, so we, we released these in 2017. So there's three books in the series. So Patty Mills is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person. Um, he plays basketball for the San Antonio Spurs in America. Uh, a week before we launched the books, he received a uh, four year, $65 million contract, US. Um, so he's huge. And these oh, books- Joe, were... Does that mean you get more royalties? Did you get a bigger <laughs> advance then? No. no, but we've sold a lot of books. And um, <laughs> so, the, you know, the, the purpose of these books was to look at um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander aspiration, to expose culture to kids, and also to talk about, to give people an insight into Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander family lives. So again, it's kind of um, addressing um, stereotypes. And we've just, poor, really poor timing, but we just released these books in, in the US. Um, so I was supposed to be doing some promo over there what, in the next couple of months, so that's not really happening. Um, and at the moment, I'm, I'm working on it. So the novel that I'm completing, uh, My Spare Heart, um, it's about a, a, a girl who, teenage girl with an Aboriginal father and a non-Aboriginal mother, and the, the mum is an alcoholic. And so through this story, I'm addressing stereotypes relating to Aboriginal drug and alcohol use. Um, and also addressing racism. So Phoebe, the central character, uh, moves into a new environment and is constantly dealing with um, both explicit and implicit racism. So it's how she kind of navigates uh, that world. So, yeah, my, my motivation is still to address racism. Um, these days it's perhaps with more of a a focus on craft, so pushing myself to write the best possible narrative, um, to have complex kind of um, uh, interactions between the characters. So I don't know if people have just watched um, like Normal People, which is a UK uh, drama, Netflix, no, Stan, but just, yeah, just looking at models of really great storytelling and um, while I'm talking about Aboriginal issues, seeing how I can push my writing forward. And um, I think I mentioned like diversity. So I, I look at my children and they're very, you know, they're, they're engaged in the modern world, but they also participate in ritual and have um, community obligations and they speak language and um, they, they have a very, very firm identity and uh, they go to a Waldorf school, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, they're living in these kind of different worlds and trying to work, trying to write. And I think, you know, a lot of Aboriginal kids are like that. Most Aboriginal people live in, in, in cities, um, are playing video, video games and watching NRL and AFL and, you know, that they're into TikTok and whatever. How do, we, how do we present these characters within our works and make, um, and make narratives relevant to their generation? Um, and also I think history, I know you're gonna cut me off, Anita. Um, history is like, when I was a kid, I, you know, we're born into a particular world and history is not exciting. So I, I would like to write um, narratives where kids can gain insight into um, key, uh, key political Aboriginal moments so that they're aware of those, those struggles and can pick them up. So much there, Jared. I didn't want to cut you off, honestly. I'm sure we all could have listened to you for much longer, including Ellen. 
but we are constrained by the clock. So people can be putting through their questions. I've got more questions now as well, but I just want to thank you for sharing um, part of your journey and some detail behind your inspiration as well. Our final uh, speaker today is Grace Lucas Pennington. And Grace is a Bundjalung um, a woman fiction and poetry editor with experience working with First Nations Australian authors, including Dr. Paul Collis, Claire G. Coleman, Kiralee Saunders and Alison Whittaker, and I'm sure most of you will know those names. Grace has also worked as a consultant, a peer assessor, a guest lecturer and a publishing industry advisor. She grew up mostly between Northern New South Wales and the Greater Logan Brisbane area, and she's interested in First Nations publishing, politics, media, social justice and the arts. She's, a, she's passionate about First Nations writing and promoting our stories. It's why she's here today. Uh, she currently works as editor with the Black and Right Indigenous Writing and Editing Project, which is based at the State Library of Queensland. She was a finalist in the 2017 Ujuru Nunapal Poetry Prize. She's also a freelancer, and we're not drumming up work today, though, just for your general knowledge. She's flat out for the rest of the year. But um, part of taking action, as we mentioned last night, is actually, um, you know, collaborations and so forth and how do we elevate our people within the industry as well so if you're looking for a deadly editor she doesn't only just edit uh, black writing it's all writing now now I'm looking for Grace on my screen there you are now Grace you are one of a uh, few qualified um, employed black editors in the country can you talk about uh, talk us through and I knew you when you were a student um, at QUT can you talk us through how you found your place at Black and Right, um, what that role actually entails as a, as a house that offers fellowships and editing and, and publication, the challenges and joys of that work. And, and I'm really keen to know from your perspective, what the literary landscape, uh, the Australian literary landscape looks like from your position, particularly um, bearing in mind Jared's mentioned conversation just a minute ago about diversity in literature and so forth. So there's about 10 questions there. Go Thank you. One. Thank you very much. And I am going to see my mom for dinner tonight. So there's that. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would firstly like to say thank you for inviting me onto this. This is a very lovely panel to be on to speak about this um, important and uh, dear to my heart issue. So thank you for that. I would also like to acknowledge that I'm on Yagarabal land out here in Western uh, Brisbane. And I'd like to thank the Yagarabal people for their continuing custodianship. It's allowing me to be here today and talking to you and sharing wonderful stories with wonderful storytellers. Um, so a little bit about me, I suppose. Um, I've always loved books and reading. I never ever thought I would work in publishing. I never considered it as a viable job opportunity, um, even though it was English was probably one of my favourite subjects at school. Um, but I lived in the library as a kid. You know, I was the kid that would get 10 books, the weekly limit, read them all twice and come back next week for another 10. And the librarians knew me and, you know, I went through the kids section in about a year and then moved on to the adult things. So um, books have always been a part of my life and in our house. Um, and that love has always been there for storytelling. And I think that like Jared and like Ellen have said, there's a certain political awakening where you get to, where you realize that maybe not all of the stories you're reading are for you. Maybe they're not, maybe, stories that you could relate to, you can still relate to them. I mean, I related to, you know, Enid Blyton and Lord of the Rings and things, just things like that. You could find something for you, but then there was always something, not that I knew that it was missing, I think, until I found it. And one of those early books was Killing Darcy. And one of those early books for me was Swallow the Air as well, where I could see characters who were modern First Nations people living in the world, you know, who had phones and who had families and who went and did normal things and talked about school and sexuality and they weren't, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for um, my place, Sally Morgan, and I don't want to say anything to denigrate that at all, but there is more than that story, like you were saying, Jared, there's more than that one story. Um, and we didn't, I didn't see a lot of that in school, never got we never got First Nations authors' books. 
um, there wasn't really the visibility for that story. So it was only through my own family that I was hearing about these other, I guess, ideas and other politics and kind of this whole other world that people in my school just didn't even know about, it seemed. Um, and I was, I was very disengaged with the education system for a long time. I didn't enjoy my schooling experience. I was bullied. I didn't want to be there at all. So I was very lucky to make it through high school. Um, and I didn't end up getting a university degree. And so I kind of, I guess, did odd hospitality jobs for a while before a opening came up at the Black and White Project, working with a fabulous mentor, Ellen Van Nieman, who I will shout out to. Um, so that was an entry level job. You didn't really need a degree or qualifications. You just had to love writing and be really willing to work hard and love books and kind of want to pursue that storytelling as a passion. So I knew very little about the industry, about what an editor did. So I learned very quickly um, and a lot. And I think a lot of that, of course, is due to the excellent mentors that we had in Ellen and Sue Abbey and you know, writers like Ali Cobby Eckerman and Sue Mack would come in and talk to us. And just that was so amazing and eye opening to be able to have those experiences with people who'd been there. So I guess it was quite easy for me to come in and see, I guess, a lot of issues in the publishing industry, a lot of challenges for writers because I was an outsider and it was just like, oh, why don't we do that? Why aren't more writers being published? And apart from the obvious, um, I guess, historical effects of invasion and colonization ongoing um, that you know people didn't have access to education or people weren't encouraged to write or say were speaking their third or fourth language and that was what they learned in apart from all those there is a inherent um, there was maybe an inherent resistance to first nations storytelling in this way and either that could be that could be the structural racism in the publishing industry in Australia. That could be um, a lack of knowledge about the Indigenous stories. But there was just this great gap that you see where First Nations writers weren't being published. They were writing, they were telling stories, but they weren't necessarily reaching audiences. And it's only really coming in as an editor that I learned about the term gatekeepers and cultural gatekeepers and what that means. And that was just a real wake up call for me that we need people in these positions commissioning, making the choices as well. Of course, we need writers, but we need people in the roles to put those writers. Um, and I'm very heartened by the way things are moving at the moment with programs like Black and Write, with training. Um, you know, people talk about diversity like it's an end goal, but it's not. It's just representation. It's not, it's actually just representing the population of who we are in our stories. And I think the only way to do that is to have representation in the publishing houses. Um, so that's a big challenge, but for me, so you had so many questions in that intro, Anita. Um, <laughs> but I guess, what, so those are some of the challenges, I guess, a lack of knowledge in the industry and a lack of willingness to try, I guess, because it's a risk averse industry, publishing's you know, getting tighter and tighter with the profit margins and people don't have the time they have the goodwill, but not maybe the time and the money to put into developing these stories because they don't have the knowledge base in-house to do that. Um, but the joy for me is seeing that change just from the short time I've been in this work is seeing people change and seeing people reach out, um, whether that's, you know, employing sensitivity readers, which means they're getting the books in-house, even though they don't have the expertise in-house, but they're looking for it. I think that's really encouraging and just the wealth of First Nations writing the more and more every year it seems. Last night Charmaine Paper Talk Green, Ani Charmaine won the ALS gold medal. There are two Indigenous writers on the Miles Franklin shortlist this year. You know we're here, it's just getting better and better and I think that the more of us there are it's just going to be overwhelming. That's fantastic. I, I don't want you to go yet. I want you, I'm wondering, now you've worked on a number of books since you've been at Black and Right. Uh, we, we came up with an amazing list of recommended readings last night when I asked the delegates to put in the chat room one book by a First Nations author that had influenced their own personal journeys, whether it was 
pointing out their white race privilege or just helping to understand um, uh, our diversity in terms of Aboriginal peoples. I'm wondering, now you can't say Jared, so someone who's not here, um, can you talk about one book that you've worked on in the Black and White program that you would recommend to our delegates today to read? Mm, mm. Um, and I know there's so many, many, all of them, all of them. Oh, um, yeah. Or one, that you, one. one particularly that you enjoyed working on. Uh, I've enjoyed working on all of them, but I think, I think what I'm really excited about is coming out in September, Nardi Simpson's Song of the Crocodile. So she's a Gamilaroi um, musician, artist, activist, speaker, um, and Nadi has written this epic um, three-generational saga in this town, Western New South Wales, and she's just done this amazing, it started off as short stories, some pieces of it, so there's a kind of spirit world interacting where the spirits are watching uh, what's happening in the world of the town and kind of interacting and these things happen, and I can't spoil it, but it all comes to a kind of head, and I think it's a way just to show race relations and the dynamics of this small town in a way that hasn't quite been done, I think. And it's just, it's just a beautiful book. It's lyrical. It's she's just an amazing writer. It's her debut novel and it's out through Hachette in September and you should all read it. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, well, we're moving on now to questions from the floor. So it would be great if people can be sending through their questions. And while they're coming through, um, I did want to backtrack, Ellen, to you for a minute, if that's okay, while we wait for questions to come through. Um, you've, we know that you've obviously written some award-winning poetry, you've written your fiction as well, but you've also written a play, if not two. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that for a minute? And maybe um, I'm interested to know which genres you which genre you prefer to write in. Yeah, um, I'll just backtrack just quickly to something that Grace said about, um, you know, about Nadi's book, which is due to come out in September, which I'm looking forward to and how that nothing like that has been done before. Um, and I was interviewing um, Bernadine Evaristo, who we would all be familiar with that name, um, the first uh, black woman to win the Booker Prize um, last year, a uh, black British woman um, based in London. And she said, there's so few um, black British representation, just like here, how there's so few uh, of us uh, being published, uh, such a small percentage of what's being published um, in a mainstream publishing industry, that she is just completely, I said, do, you know, do you feel overwhelmed by having to represent your community in literature when there's so few representation through art. And she said, no, actually, it means the possibilities are endless. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really see with our book, books as well. Every new book by an Indigenous writer here is covering new ground, is doing something different, mm -hmm. is from a, a community, a language group, a geographical region that we might not have seen before, like, you know, Ani Charmaine saying last night, thank you for um, supporting Yamaji writing. Well, it's like, no, <laughs> thank you, Ani Charmaine, for writing your book, because you have given us all a gift. Um, so I, through my work, I'm always thinking about that too, like, how can I... Um, you know, add something new, um, give us something new. And so maybe that is why, why I have a fascination with form and why I'm interested in breaking form and trying out new forms. And so um, I will say playwriting definitely hasn't come naturally to me. I found it a, a huge struggle. I've been working on a play for four years mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel anywhere close to be, being finished. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do also want to say that um, the specialty of right is it was when I started my first book, poetry book, Comfort Food, it, it again took a five-year apprenticeship to, um, to become a published poet because it's mm -hmm. such a different form 
um, it's almost like going from being a deadly soccer player to then, you know, trying out for the AF, the women's AFL or something like that. You know, it's, it's a, there's different rules um, and a different journey. Uh, but why I'm committed to this play is because I have been able to work with some really beautiful theatre mob, um, uh, black theatre mob, and being able to see this whole new possibility of storytelling and being able to challenge myself to collaborate. It's not just me as a creative that benefits, but there's many creatives that are employed through this process. So it's different to me um, working um, mainly by myself and working with, um, yeah, just working with the, you know, the standard publishing um, setup, which is sort of like, you know, rather than I feel the theatre is more, yeah, so it was just a different, a different way. Uh, and I think this particular piece um, is very poetry based, but like my dramaturg, um, Yorta Yorta woman, Andrea James told me, she said, we've got to turn this poem <laughs> into a play. And believe me, if I could just hand it over and she could do it, I would be happy. But it's actually doing doing that work myself and, and being a student of um, uh, all of the beautiful theatre work that has gone on before me. Thank you. Uh, we've got some questions coming in and I've still got more of my own, but this one's for Ellen and Grace. How do you balance editing and writing? Do you want to do that first, Grace? Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I don't really. I write very little, not as much as I would like, um, because it's very easy not to write, I think. And I use the excuse that I'm in a privileged position now where I can be helping other people with their writing, and that's where I put my focus. So I write very little. Thank you. No balance. Uh Excuse me, could you just read your poem, please? It was a finalist in the 2017 Ujiru Prize for the person who doesn't write. Thank you. No, we're answering questions now, aren't we? <laughs> read the poem. Uh, Ellen, do you want, do not want to answer the question? Do you want me to read the poem too? Ellen, Ellen can follow up that question once you finish your poem. Thank you. I'm in oh. control. I'm the chair. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Lucky you warned me. Okay, this poem was called An Arrival. And I was thinking about what it means to come to somewhere where you're not from and what it means to be, to arrive and to be welcomed or not, as you may be, whoever you are. So, an arrival. We came across water, made sure in darkness, woke on sand. In daylight, we saw strong, Young men, warriors, they picked their way toward us. We had nothing. They came close, pointed their weapons at us. They asked us who we were, why we had come, sat us down on the earth to wait. They gave us water. We were weak from travel exhausted. We waited. News spread. The sun was close to the line of the earth. They came, the delegates, stern folk who smiled cold like the ones we ran from. Healers arrived. They had traveled overnight to reach us. The nurses, the doctors, they closed their mouths. The lips did not know the shape of the desperation they saw in bodies, in faces. Their hearts did not know the strange strength of the hope under our flesh. But their eyes knew the stories of the scars. Their bones had not known the weight of those who had died on our journey. Their hands did not know the shape of the fears that we carried but they saw the long st shadows stretching out behind us. They did not understand us, or we them, but to hope is to open, and through it we are opened. So it began.
Thank you, um, Grace. And there was there was method in that because I think while we are so blessed to have you as an editor, your words are incredibly powerful. So I hope I do hope that you find time to do some more writing. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I've got a question for you, Jared, coming up next. In the uh, but uh, Ellen, do you want to respond to that question about how you balance editing and writing? Yeah, sure. And and thanks, Grace. That was a beautiful reading, and it is. Um very difficult to balance both because both um, require your full energy and um, yeah, your full intellectual um, ability. So I have actually, um, you know, I um, moved away from black and white um, a few years ago because uh, although I really were, was enjoying my work and I really enjoy it, editing particularly first nations writers um i could not balance that with a uh writing career that also requires um you know other things of me as well um but always my ethos is to to do both to service my community uh, and i will talk bernardine erivisto or also uses the word literary activist. So I see myself as a literary activist, an educator, an editor, and a writer. Uh, that's all just giving space for each of those things. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen, for that. Um, Jared, my question to you is about process and methodology. And I'm interested to know in terms of your um, fiction writing, are you a plotter? Are you, or are you a panster? And also, there was. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the methodology you use for Calypso Summer? Is that the one that? that sorry, because I've read all your books. That's the yeah. one around lots of um, involvement, engagement with local community because it was plants and a lot of protocols around that. Can you talk about that? Because I think that's the sort of conversation that Australian authors who want to include. Um, particularly cultural practices and so forth, and they need to understand. Yeah, probably I'll, I'll talk a little bit about clips though, but probably songs that sound like blood was the more difficult and the more risque in terms of like exploration of topic. But usually, yeah, I'm I'm thinking about the, the story for at least a year before I start writing. Um, and during that time, I talk to people who were kind of, who were represented in that narrative. So people that have actually experienced some of those things, if they're experiences that I haven't lived myself. Um, so uh, yeah, from when I first started writing, anything that involved family or representation of my community or individuals, um, I would check in with people that knew those people. So when I was writing about my great grandfather, I was speaking to my dad, his, his, um, his, the, the generation above them, his children, et cetera, to kind of get endorsement, you know, their blessing and buy-in. And um, so with Calypso Summer, yeah, there was discussion about um, traditional plant use. And, you know, I had to think about what I was revealing and why and how to deal with that um, because I didn't want people to just be foraging traditional plants, not going to plants and medicines. So there was a lot of sensitivity around that. But um, songs that sound like blood, that was that was probably the mo more difficult. Um, because in the narrative, um, really, it's about a girl who wants to study music at, at um, university. And I wrote this because of the collapse of some of our, our the, the, the funding to um, particular programs, music programs, arts programs, um, which we're experiencing again. But I knew that I could have had a boy kind of stalk scale, get scale narrative, and I didn't want to do that. And the other thing was, um, I guess, leading up to um, same-sex marriage campaign. So it was kind of quite before that, but I, I was just sick of all the conservatism. So I wanted to have uh, I didn't want to do boy meets girl narrative. I wanted, um, I wanted to uh, represent a same sex relationship, um, and a, and a very you know a healthy one. And so I spoke to um, 
to gay friends who had been in relationships for the last 20 to 25 years and said, hey, do you mind if I write about a same-sex marriage and, you know, relationship and you guys can check in? And so I spoke to other um, gay friends, Aboriginal Māori women in particular, and then with, um, because that's published by Magabala Books, and I said to Magabala Books, look, um, can you set up some, some readers, anonymous readers of this? So, um, and if it feels like it's a, a book written by a 40 year old um, hetero fellow, um, then we need to pull it. And so they did, they, 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 that was my request. And Ellen, I think the conversation started with Ellen. Ellen said, hey, what are you, what are you writing next? And I had this rough idea and I said, Ellen, um, you know, can you be across this um, and look at that representation? So, you know, there, there's Aboriginal protocols and there's protocols, I guess it's just about being respectful. Um, if I write about a barmaid, I want to spend time speaking with a barmaid to get, to get real insight into their life. You know, a 15-year-old skateboarder, I need to, I need to portray um, something that has integrity. Just wondering, Jared, if at any point, because uh, in either of, in any of your novels, if you got feedback from a community level, family, organisations or whomever, that suggested you needed to cut material or alter material or that wasn't for the public domain, did you ever have any of those experiences? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've had, I've had things, yeah. And, um, do you, we don't need to know the detail, but how do you manage that? Uh, well... I think it's like, in regards to my community, I mean, I need to, I, I want to be able to create stuff that they're proud of um, and that suits our aspirations. So, um, you know, there was one thing that was a bit disappointing because I thought it was really valuable to share a particular story. Um, and at that time, they just, they thought it was a bit premature to tell it. Um, but then there's a really difficult story relating to my great grandmother and it's, it's harrowing. It's the most harrowing story. And, you know, like my family want me to tell that story. I haven't got to it, but they were really insistent that I write it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it can be mostly like, but, you know, people saying no is few and far between. I think it's like people are usually, um, will understand your motivation and, you know, really they add to what you're writing. And that's been my experience. Whenever I go through protocols, it's like there'll be um, a team of people with me on this particular journey that helped me to write a much more insightful book. And I thought I was going to get slayed in, in regards to writing a young, uh, no, young adult novel which features two gay women. And, I, and today, today, unless anyone else can tell me, but I don't think that I've, you know, no one's, um, no one's kind of really been overly critical of that. I guess my question was around, oh, I, thank you for answering that. And it's good to hear. I, I guess one of my questions around the protocol side of things is quite often I hear, um, including in my own friendship group um, of non-Indigenous writers who say, you know, it's with the, 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 the writer has the right to write whatever they want and this Western notion of, um, you know, it's the, art, the artist has the right to be creative and so forth. And, and I write from a completely different position, which is very similar to yours. And that is, I want the people I write about to actually have, um, to be proud of the story and to own the story and this, because the story is for them and so forth. I'm just conscious of the time, there's four minutes. Um, do we have another question from the floor? There's 56 people or 50, two if you take us off um i did are there any questions coming in do you, so jared you alluded to something you're working on at the moment um ellen do you want to talk about um, a project you're working on at the moment um no i just i guess if we if we wanted to make any comments um more broadly about where we see things happening uh, with um, the Black Lives 
matter movement that's going on at the moment and if we have a wish list of things that we we want to see um, in the future. Off you go, you lead that discussion in. I think this is a whole a whole bigger conversation that obviously can't be fit into the remaining two minutes of this presentation, but I would love to see um, our industry take more of a stand on this mm. issue. Mm. Um, I would love to see more um, representation in publishing house. I'd love for every publishing house to have a strategy um, to, mm. to uh, employ, to have us in leadership positions and uh, to, to make sure that, um, yeah, like I think it, the whole industry needs to be de decolonized if, you know, there's no really, there's no getting away from that. And in some ways, um, some of the power structures have regressed. Um, I think the early 90s was in some ways a more exciting time. Even though we are having representation, uh, we do also need um, to be able to own our stories and to own the direction mm. that our stories want to go. Mm. Can I just add to that? Sorry. Um, and it kind of says to what you and Jared were saying as well, that, you know, this responsibility when we publish, when we write, it's not made up. It's not something we're just doing for because we think that we matter, you know, it's because it's real. It's because they do matter. The stories out there and who land in these communities and if, you know, you can't just write whatever you want and there needs to be a discussion about ethical publishing because it, that's what really what we're talking about is the ethics of putting what you put out into the world and whether you're going to cause hatred or whether you're going to cause people to connect and publishers need, I think there should be a Hippocratic oath for publishers to make sure what they're putting out into the world is beneficial and helpful for people is not going to cause division. I really think that. And I think this is one of the things that Magabala does so well. The books are to uplift people and to teach people and to give people knowledge rather than to publish some ideological driven hatred thing that I won't even mention any author's names because they're not deserving of it. We need ethical publishing. Yeah. We'll have a whole conference about it, yeah. I think, you know, kind of it answering the question around um, protocol and, and Black Life Matters, but like, I think it's Larissa Berent in Protocol Guidelines and maybe um, in Dula Yella, your um, work, Anita, it might have been Larissa who was mindful of um, Catherine, Catherine Susanna Pritchard's Rumbi Innes and the, the representation of um, pr promiscuity of Aboriginal women. And she thought about that when women were being, you know, cross-examined in rape cases and things like this. And how those, those representations really informs people's attitudes and, and particular, particular outcomes in their life. So, you know, that thing about protocol and representation, it has bearing on what, how people think about us and how they respond to us. Um, so yeah, protocol, it's so critical. And yeah, making sure those representations do have, I guess what I call an integrity. Um, with, in, t in terms of looking at publishing stories, Black Life Matters, um, a lot of people that are, um, that are present today work in universities or in writers' centres, lecturers. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is when times get tough, it's always Aboriginal services that get cut. Um, so, you know, my thing is, um, I just hope that our allies can, can work to ensure that um, access to Aboriginal people, whether it be in universities, writing centres, um, do not get diminished during this time. Thank you, Jared. Um, I'm just conscious of time. I was trying to listen and type at the same time. And I just wanted to say, like last night, a series of call to actions. I think very simple one is if you are attached to a publishing house, you get an email off to your editor, your publisher, whoever, your marketing person uh, about actually making a statement, stepping up and um, have and actually standing beside the authors that you publish as well. And the other one, Grace, I forgot the, the, the term you use. It wasn't a code of ethics. It was a... Hippocratic oath. 
do no harm. Okay. Do no harm. And Just number number two, no that um, that there is um, an introduction or establishment of a Hippocratic Hippocratic oath that will be drafted by Grace Lucas Pennington. Um, on the table, Grace, that's what we like. Action, action, action. Um, it's now 4.32 on the Murray clock, um, a couple of hours earlier in, 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 um, in Adelaide. And um, there was another question, but I do believe there's probably more, Roger, I do believe you've got to move along because there's probably something else happening this afternoon. I just want to thank everybody for joining our session. Um, please get on to Auslit and look at all Jared's and Grace's and Ellen's work um, and do share anything that you've learned today anything new share it with everybody in your circle so thank you very much everybody and i hope the rest of the azel conference goes fantastically